It's almost showtime, Carolyn. Sir. It is almost showtime. That's right, John Vignasco. In fact, it is showtime. Good morning. Welcome to your Saturday. Back with your garden buddies. I'm Brian Maine. We've got John Vignasco, Tiger Pella Fox. The computer's running. Uh, the audio seems to be okay on Facebook, right, Tiger? Why are you jinxing it? You've right got now? that look on your face. <laughs> Why are you jinxing You've it? You've done such a good job the past couple of weeks. We hope you had a good week and are ready to start the weekend. Now, here in San Diego, uh, we woke up to rain. I was caught by surprise, totally. Hey, from Fallbrook to the station here is a half-hour drive for me, right? 45 minutes today? Actually, 45 minutes, probably. <clears throat> But my windshield wipers were on the entire time. Whoa. So I woke up this morning and look out in the sidewalk, and usually it's the sprinklers. Oh, get, you know, sprinklers were on this morning. I went, no, this is more than sprinklers. Went outside. Wow. How did we miss the weather report, John? Did you see this coming? Uh, no, because last night it was clear. Yeah, and I, we, we were <laughs> relying on John <laughs> to be our weather last night. Last night it was cloudy. Well, he lives in Fallbrook. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know what it's like in Arizona. I was okay? surprised. You tell me you were surprised. But it's going to switch rain. in just a couple days down here. We're going to we have temperatures near 100 again at the end, end of next week. See, he's High our weatherman. 90s. He's our meteorologist, John Vegnasco. <laughs> That's right. Now it's going to get hot again and un, 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 unbearable, right? You know, I I <clears> always <throat> feel and I could be wrong as <laughs> Tiger likes to preface his <laughs> statements. <laughs> but I always feel September and October are the hottest months in, they in are. Southern California. No, they are. Just when you think you're getting into the fall, right. football, and it's still 95 degrees Yeah, outside. we don't have that, that kind of weather in San Diego until late November. Right. And then it's also harder when you're watching stuff happen across the country. Yeah. And you're like, oh, it's cold and, you know, this state and degrees. this and that. And, and we're like you're it. sitting out there looking and there's a Santa Ana wind blowing but outside. But you know what? That's another reason why we've had an influx of so many people over the past 30 years moving to San Diego. Right. They're watching football in November <laughs> on the West Coast, yep. and it's 85 degrees, yeah. and it's snowing where they are. Hey, Marge, look at the weather out there. we got to move there. I was just to say that about too, uh, Torrey Pines, right, in yep. February, watching and it, golf. And it was beautiful on the beach there. Right. right. No, that's – so, so, yeah, it was surprising to wake up. And you know what, though? It's a pleasant surprise because you know, yes. it, it was hot yes. for a while, so it's nice to have this little break, and it'll get hot again. We're not out of the— No, not by the, any means. Yeah. yeah. But I wore short pants this morning like a fool. I, I didn't look outside my window, and like I'm wearing a, a Hawaiian shirt I'll show you shorts. during the break. <laughs> <laughs> and those watching you got them on backwards or what? Uh, those on Facebook can, can watch me as I show John how to wear them like a fool. Kathy <laughs> and uh, Neelan says that fall's in the air up there. Ooh. But that's Northern California. Yeah. And, Kathy, that's Gosh. smoke. That's not fall. <laughs> it's probably just a heavy, heavy layer of smoke. Yeah, what's up with the fires wear a, up there? Wear what's a mask the latest? when you go outside. Are anything under control up there with those fires? I don't think so. I think they're all still not, yeah, that's, that's not terrible. Contained. Well, they keep talking about the winds, right, yeah. being out of control. We haven't so, really had too much in wind. the way of winds down here. No. no. It's hard it's, for me to tell because it's always windy. But house. you know what's funny is they, the sunsets have been – pretty nice and i didn't realize it but the smoke is coming they they they, they're saying the smoke is here from the fires up north and and during the day i didn't really see it i thought it was always clear but then sunset at sunset you start to see that real glow in the air did you um i don't know if you guys had a chance to look at our newsletter this week yeah i I saw your smoking addiction in the newsletter smoking addiction yeah how do you get all those rose cards oh that's right See? Good setup, Tiger. Nice yeah. newsletter, John. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> well, hey. <laughs> it was three days ago. Yeah, yeah, it was three days ago, right? <laughs> Is that Tuesday or Wednesday when you... That's where the the uh, Honus Wagner card came from. Yes, I saw that. And, you you know, John's very um, up-to-date because the card just sold last week for, what, $6.5 million, And John has a reference in the newsletter about that card right. uh, by a private collector. Yeah. I mean, that just, you know who bought a, a Honus Wagner card years ago? And I don't know if it was this one. It was Bruce McNall, who owned the L.A. Kings hockey team, and Wayne Gretzky. I seem to remember they, that. They went in together and bought that card. Don't know if it's this one, but it was another Honus Wagner. And, and they're talking about how he was against tobacco and tobacco chewing and didn't want kids to associate him, him and that. That's... That could be an urban legend. They don't know that that's true for sure. They think it's possible that he wanted more money than they were willing to pay him. Mm. So so they don't know. But anyway, it makes a good story to sure. say. It's a great story. Yeah. 1911, a, I believe. 
right. What else happened in 1911? Was it 1910 or 11? 1910. Okay. The nursery. So a year after Tiger's Nursery right. yeah. came into being. Well, anyway, the reason we're talking about <laughs> baseball trading cards is that was a trading card that was in packets of cigarettes. Right. It was a way to promote smoking, right? And in England, the H.O. Wills Company came out with uh, Rose trading cards. And there were 100 in the series. And it was 19... 1912 was one, but it was two years in a row. Now I forget. Do they even it, exist anymore? A lot of them do. I was going to say they have to be worth a fortune. Right? A lot of them do, and I'm thinking of doing a PowerPoint presentation where you've got a, oh the the cards. No, you the mean? cards. Oh yeah, I've got a complete set, of yeah. course. So, so they're, they're <laughs> so they're not hard to get. They're not hard to get, and they're certainly not six million dollars a piece. But but they're not something I everyone talks about all the time. I, I don't never never heard of Rose trading cards. Oh, that's why I put them in the newsletter. <laughs> well, you you know what? You're but I want to do a PowerPoint presentation with a picture of the Rose if it still exists today, mm -hmm. and the trading card next to it. Because if you looked at the newsletter, those trading cards are are really kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, you know what? I'll bring some in next week. Hey, that'd be great. And show them to you. I'll trade you my Johnny Bench card for a <laughs> Sim Salabim Rose card. Yeah. Do you think? No, do you Sim think... Salabim doesn't have a Rose card. These are all new. over yeah, over a hundred years. Way right? too new. Do you, do you think they picked the roses based on what colors they had to be able to paint the pictures, or do you think they just picked the roses based on what was popular? Well, back time? then, I think they just. Paint picked roses that existed. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> there were it was nowhere near as many as there are today. Yeah. Like hybrid teas had just, uh, you know, be started Became to become popular. Around. Right. So how are your roses doing, Tiger? Great. I I've I've been um neglecting them a little bit. That's but okay. They don't mind. No, they don't. And the Chrysler Imperial that I have is an amazing bloomer. The um. What about juice. your Ford F one fifty? How's that doing? <laughs> <laughs> the orange juice one um, bloomed out recently, but it, I see buds on it again. I was just at someone's house this week, and they were so disappointed with their roses, and because they weren't blooming, mm -hmm. and and I saw the buds developing. I'm like, it's it's a season. They, it's in between. They they, yeah. co they bloom, and then they stop for a minute, and then they come back. Just like and I've got the my latest roses, Nimbus and Lemon Spice. Uh, just uh, clipped off a couple last night. Brought them in the house. Beautiful. Yeah. Lemon spice has a nice, subtle aroma. Lemony, right? Yeah. It's not obvious, but you get close enough, and it's there. Yeah. Lemon. Well, anyway, I I wasn't talking about roses. I wanted to talk yeah. about the article on the African wisteria tree. Yeah. And I never realized, you've seen pictures, I suppose, of uh, bonsai wisteria. Yeah. Those weren't wisteria. They were the uh, bolisanthus, which is the African wisteria tree. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that either. And who bonsaied it? <laughs> well, Mr. Who, Miyagi. Who's not the question? <laughs> <laughs> it's um, the fact that I always thought that that was really difficult to do because I thought, you know, wisterias are vines, are, right? And, How do and you... they grow very aggressive. Yeah, so. yeah, like bonsaiing a eucalyptus or something <laughs> it's just good, not practical good analogy be for fun sure. though <laughs> <laughs> bonsai eucalyptus that would have to be like a daily thing that you would do oh clipping roots and training it i'll tell you one mistake i made at my new house was letting a couple of uh seeds come up which ones uh uh eucalyptus oh really so oh, eucalyptus seeds come up yeah so oh. now in my backyard i have a eucalyptus tree that's probably 12 feet tall. Oh, geez. So it's not, you can't be pulled out anymore. I got to yeah. go cut it down. Messy, <laughs> messy, messy well, eucalyptus. I just don't want any eucalyptus on my property. So, anyway, um, the reason I put that article there is because I've always wanted one of those trees. And I had one at my old house, and it was just years of neglect. And finally, I put it in a spot where it would grow. And, and, just the year that I moved was the year that it was up to size where it should be blooming. Oh, my God. So I went to the seed stead last year and, and planted some <laughs> seeds for um, Bolisanthus, and now I've got, I think, three of them. So they don't so, they, they take a while to bloom? Because I figured if it, if it would bonsai, it would bloom early. They take a while to develop? They, and... 
Well, they have a real hard wood. They use in Africa, they use the wood to make furniture and things. It's it's mm -hmm. a really uh, hard wood. And most bonsai trees are pretty old, right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. So they probably would, uh, I don't think you would grow it from a seed as a bonsai. You'd probably uh, grow it in, either in the ground or as a larger pot than larger pot and, then dig it up and, and move we're going to go to a break it. guys our first break all right end of segment one segment two coming up melinda myers is our guest today oh yeah Get excited your, to hear your, your, papers, your computer keyboards out a lot of questions a lot of comments hopefully john's quote of the week before we bring on linda myers so to set the stage that's what's happening linda myers next it is a saturday morning maybe saturday afternoon where you are you are tuned in to garden america brian main john begnasker tiger pella fox Going to pay some bills on BizTalk Radio back after these messages. Welcome back to the show. A longer break on BizTalk Radio, shorter here on uh, Facebook Live. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Melinda Myers is standing by. She is on the on-deck circle. But first of all, going to toss over to John Bagnasco. Today's or this week's quote of the week. Today's quote as well, John. Odd quote today, I think. And the quote is, one day you discover you're alive. Explosion, concussion, illumination, delight. You laugh, you dance around, you shout. But not long after, the sun goes out. Snow falls, but no one sees it on an August noon. Was that uh, Stan Laurel? No, <laughs> that was Ray Bradbury. Yeah. That was a quote from Dandelion Wine. Ray Bradbury? Yeah. A hear... song? What? Isn't there a song, Dandelion Wine? Oh, no. I know what you're thinking of, but no. <laughs> something totally different. Oh, okay. Okay, Tiger, now that, now that you've come up with that, I'm going to talk. Dandelion toss... Wine's a book by Ray Bradbury. It's about his youth growing up yes. right i'm going to toss it to you tiger now don't mess this up as you bring on as we bring on melinda myers how can i mess up introducing melinda wire myers our most wonderful guest as you i mess it you up just name. did <laughs> <laughs> melinda save me good morning how are you it's melinda that's good <laughs> <laughs> oh melinda what a week it's been um thank you so much for joining us this weekend how are you doing i'm doing great you know, I um, I speak at our state fair, and this year I did three presentations a day for 11 days, and so I'm finally back in my garden finding out how well the weeds did. Oh, <laughs> so no. it's kind of good to pull a few weeds and harvest a few things. So that's always good. Great to meet with gardeners, but good to be back in the garden a little bit, working how, on the other things. <laughs> how was the state fair up there? Um, was it attended well? Um, lots of people? You know, it was you know with the whole you know concern for health and safety, yeah. um, we had good crowds. I'm in this garden area. I help design with um, other people, and so I'm surrounded by gardens. And people were pretty good about being socially distanced. And you know, I I might have been one of the few wearing a mask when I was out amongst the crowds, but it it was good to see gardeners in person. And um, I was on stage and then answering questions. And, um, I, you know, it just was nice to, to be talking to gardeners live and in person. And hopefully we're all still safe and healthy after this event. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing right now because it's such a hot topic, gardening. I oh, mean, you know, yeah. after post-pandemic, we're still all, you know, working in our gardens, planting plants, you know, taking <clears throat> care of what we planted. And, you know, I'm wondering – did you see an increase in activity there? Because, you know, one of the things that's uh, happening right now on, on the Internet is these people that advertise, they'll, they'll help you landscape your yard by just taking a photo and then, you know, being able to show you what you can do. And there's a lot of websites popping up to kind of help people with landscape design. So was there uh, – did you think that there was an influx of people that wasn't, weren't there before? 
Oh, you bet. I, I think a lot of um, – I, I probably had 25% of the crowd were brand new, first time they've come to see me at fair, new gardeners, lots of good questions, lots of people doing exactly what you're saying, trying to figure out – I've got this landscape, or I'm creating a landscape, looking for ideas, um, and a little overwhelmed. I think mm. it can be very overwhelming when you're new to gardening, even as experienced gardeners. <laughs> sometimes, when I moved to my place, I think it was about eight, nine years ago. Um, you know, I had a blank, a blank slate, and I came from a small city lot, so I had my neighbor's house, the parkies, but I had a very, I had borders. So I had an area. Now I have 11 acres and it's like, whoa, where do I start? And so I think it can be very overwhelming. And I think some people look for easy answers. And I I don't know about you, but I really think part of the fun of landscaping is, this sounds very, Hmm. is the journey, right? Figuring out, learning from your mistakes, assessing your landscape. You know, the first look may not be the reality. You know, uh, I, when I moved in here, we were doing some, putting in some walkways and things, and so I didn't plant much garden, many gardens, because I'm like, I'm not going to redo these in a year. And a year later, I realized where I wanted the gardens originally changed, because I yeah. figured out I spend time here looking out in my garden from the house or out in the yard or where I have easier access or what made sense. And sometimes it's about taking the time that somebody who doesn't know you may just look at the big picture and go, let's put it here, here, and here, which is good, helpful information, but you need to have a good part in that whole process. Yeah, definitely. And then being patient, I think, is one of the yeah. biggest things people need to understand. And, and it is a difficult thing. I mean, you, you know, if you move into a home or if, you know, your home has been sitting there for years even and you've seen this blank yard and just haven't had the funds or the ability to do anything about it you want to make it happen right away but as you're saying you know there's things that you're gonna see or you know watch develop and that might change your opinion on what you do you know john you know is in this situation right now where he does have to some degree a blank slate of a property and it's you know he's focused on where am i going to plant this tree where what am I going to leave this space for? Because he has roses to take care of. Take care of. Um, so, you know, when people are planning out a landscape design, it's more than just having pretty things in your, your yard, right, Melinda? Oh, you bet. You want to make sure that those pretty things are suitable to the growing conditions. And sometimes that quick look isn't the same. What's the drainage pattern? When I bought my first house in the city, I did all the things wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I was so excited. I finally have a house I could plant. I put some perennials in. Turned out that's where all the ice and snow settled, and they all died the first year because the drainage, I didn't realize where all that drainage in those wet feet in winter would be. And the same goes on the opposite end. You know, where are the winds blowing through and the sun You know, you could do east, west, north, and south, but what are the other structures that are influencing it, existing plants, um, you know, a west face where maybe the heat builds up. And so it does take time to evaluate that. And I don't know about you, Tiger, but the best landscapes I've seen are the ones where the designer works with the homeowner. Mm -hmm. So their personality is reflected, so it doesn't look like plan B, you know, I'm sure you've been on tours where you've gone to gardens. And you're like, oh, I can tell who the designer was here because it looks just like that yard over there that yeah. I saw. As opposed to, oh, this is great. The designer provides some good insight, but the homeowner's personality is reflected. And the site is considered, like you're saying, which is so important to survival of the plants and maintaining the integrity of the design. You know, if it requires a lot of pruning, is that homeowner going to do it? wouldn't happen for me. I want low maintenance. (laughs) Yeah, that is true. And then, you know, when we're talking about shrub height, you know, as an example on on my property, I have one area where I wanted to plant a green wall, but I didn't want to hedge it. So I picked a hedge that's going to grow up to eight feet and then stop because I don't want to get up on a ladder and trim this thing down every (laughs) six months or year even. So, you know, taking those things into consideration is very important. Hey, Melinda, we're going to take a break right now, but when we get back, we'll continue talking with Melinda Myers and figuring out some good insights on uh, planning out your new garden. 
Yeah, landscape design, and if you are the thing, so uh, whatever topic you want to discuss, of course, questions and comments with Melinda, always a great guest, so this is your opportunity. Whatever's on your mind in terms of uh, what we are discussing today, as uh, Tiger mentioned, we are going to take a break uh, going into uh, segment three from segment two, if you are keeping track, and those on Biz Talk Radio, Brian Main, John Begnesco, Tiger Palafox, welcome to Garden America. All righty, we are right back with you, whether you're tuned in on BizTalk Radio, listening to last week's show, or with us live on Facebook. We do appreciate it. Magnasco, Maine, and Tiger, Palafox. Yeah, that's who we are. We've got Melinda Myers with us this morning. We're just kicking things off and talking about landscape design. Melinda, let me jump in real quick before Tiger here, as we talked about before the break, as far as, you know, making mistakes with landscape design, so on and so forth. Are you suggesting maybe that you move in first, settle in, and get kind of a good feeling for where you live and the environment before diving in with all your ideas? Oh, definitely. You know, I think one of the other, I think you, when you buy a house or you move into a home new or or existing, you have different ideas of where you're going to spend your time, what you're looking out the window. Are you standing cooking and looking out the kitchen window? Are you spending time in the living room or a family room and you want to look out are you going to be sitting out back because it tends to have afternoon shade? Or are you going to be sitting out front, maybe watching sunsets? Just kind of getting a feel for how you use that space. And that time is going to save you a lot of money and time in the end because you may design a landscape and then decide this isn't working by the way we live in our home. So then you have to change again. I, Tiger and I were chatting a bit before, and he, he compared it to changing majors in college. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I yeah. thought that was a great analogy, Tiger. Yeah, you never know what you're going to come out of college with, but you you always have an idea what you're going yeah. in with. But yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, you got to be flexible, right, Melinda? Be flexible and, and keep that in mind as you're investing so you're not – You're going to be reinvesting, but maybe you can limit that with a plan. And by spending some time before jumping in and putting plants on the ground, and I know how anxious people are to do it because I've been there. You know, it's like, oh, I got a yard. I can start planting now. And I'm a horticulturist, but I'm a gardener too. And so taking that time, and it sounds like that's what John's doing too, is he's plotting out his new space. You know, what's going to work for the short term and, and most importantly, the long term? You know, I did change my major my senior year <laughs> in college. <laughs> now, let me ask you, it was chemistry, right? You changed it? No, no, that was early on. I changed that my freshman year. <laughs> no, well, see, there he goes, two yeah. or three yeah. times. Now, my through my junior year, I was majoring in accounting, and I changed it to horticultural marketing my senior year. Well, there you go. A good and, choice for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish Melinda was my next door neighbor. <laughs> she would just she would just fill you full of good well, happy you know, compliments you, all the time. Well, not only that, you could have all kinds of fun because if you have a neighbor who's into plants, yeah. rather oh. than horses like my new neighbor's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Something to relate to a, yeah. on a better scale. Yeah, for maybe those I can of us that are plant geeks. Maybe yeah, I can definitely. get some horse manure. Yeah, there, <laughs> there you go. See, yeah, roses love ho- horse manure. Hey, and then Melinda, also as far as timing is putting in the landscape. Um, you know, I know here on the West Coast in probably Arizona, Utah, Nevada, the the fall, late fall, winter is a great time to put in a new yard because it's cooler. We get some rain, and it gives it a chance to get established. What about Midwest and East Coast? What's the best time of year to put in a new landscape? Fall, but earlier than you guys, because we get that cold weather. But you're right, the soil's warm, the air is cooler. When I was working with the City of Milwaukee Forestry, we did some research and found our fall-planted trees had a higher survival rate. I think part of that's the weather, and part of it is the comfort of the person doing the gardening. (laughs) You know, if you're comfortable, you're going to take your time to put that plant in correctly. Spring is also a good time, but spring can be very wet, can be cold, Um, You have a long list of things you need to get done. And a lot of the nurseries, I think, across the country are starting to bring in fresh plants. You know, so it's not the leftover plants from spring in the Midwest and the Northeast and West and East and South, but 
they're bringing in fresh nursery stock because fall is a great time for planting. And we've and, and I'm I'm complaining to the wrong people, but for us, we've had a hot, dry summer. And if you put in a new landscape, you are really struggling not only to keep things watered, but, you know, scorch was an issue because the plants couldn't pull up the moisture as fast as they were losing it. So you really had to work hard to keep those new plantings alive. Fall usually is a little less stressful on the plants and the gardener, too. But earlier than you guys because our winter arrives a little sooner and a little harsher. Yeah, but you bring up a lot of good points from the aspect, even the people planting it, even the people doing the work, you know, when it's 97 degrees outside and you're using a digging bar to dig a hole for a tree, you know, you're going to just get it in the hole and walk away. You're tired. Good enough. You know, but if it's, um, you know, 72 degrees outside and there's a chance of rain tomorrow and that soil is soft from it raining, you know, a few days before, it's a little easier to dig that hole. You're going to take a little bit more care in planting that tree. But then, you know, as we talk about too, just people force it. You know, they, they want to have their yard ready for summer. And so they do it late spring. And, you know, now the plants are stressed. And, and as you mentioned, people also think like, oh, they'll just water more. And, and But that doesn't always work either with plants. It's not so much they, they might have all the water that they need, but it's just too hot for some plants, right? Oh, exactly. And that brings up evaluating your growing conditions. I, you know, hardiness zones are a good starting place. Um, most of us in this side of the country use the USDA. I'm guessing you guys are using sunset because of all those unique microclimates. But summer heat, winter cold, winds, all of those things add up. Um, Cornell University has a great blog on site assessment for better gardens and landscapes. And I thought it was very an excellent publication. Whether you're working with a designer or doing it yourself, it takes you through those things we're talking about step by step, how to measure the light, how to consider temperature and wind and all those things. So I think the more you do your homework, the better design you're going to have. Designers can help you uh, save money because they've got that form and, and, you know, that idea. But if you do your homework, you're going to find the best designer for you, whether it's a website, an online design app, or a real-life person, and you're going to end up with a better result. I also think you're going to have more fun. I think the more you understand, and we're probably talking to the wrong audience because I think all your listeners are as excited about gardening as (laughs) we are, but it's fun. You know, it's fun to do that exploration. Go on garden tours. See what other people are doing. Visit botanic gardens. Get ideas. Bring them back and share them with your designer or use them as you plan your own design as well. And then you know what grows in your area, too, which is so important. You know, speaking of what grows in your area, my son is moving to Indianapolis in October. Oh, yay. And he, <laughs> yeah. he, he thinks he's going to grow uh, southern magnolia. Is that too far north? We, there are, there's a southern magnolia growing at our botanic garden. Really? In the, in the, it's not huge, <laughs> um, and, it's in, and it's in a somewhat sheltered location. So I think, you know, he's, he grew up with you as a dad, so he's probably used to pushing the limits and growing unusual plants. So I, I would say I wouldn't count on it quickly becoming a huge <laughs> shade tree, but right. maybe a small specimen in a sheltered location, yeah. and then bragging rights. Look at my southern magnolia yeah. growing here. It sounds like special needs in a way. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's really excited about, you know, he grew up in California, so he's excited to uh, for a whole new plant palette. And I had a quick question, too. I, I, I may be totally wrong with this, but I know in a couple weeks the American Rose Society is having their fall convention in Milwaukee. And did I see you were going to be one of the speakers there? I am. They have a community outreach. And, of course, I know I'm not a rose expert. So when they approached me, I said, how about I do companion plants for rose? <laughs> there you because go. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be talking to a bunch of expert rosarians about roses because they know way more than I do. So um, they were excited by the topic. It's an outreach effort to the community as well as the people that are going to the the uh, meeting. And so I thought this was a great topic for home gardeners and maybe even some of the rosarians might go, oh, I never thought of that, and talk about some of the plants I find work well with my 
hardy shrub roses and and uh, things that I've seen and observed. But you're right. Not you, talking to the rosaries <laughs> about roses, John. I, well, I, <laughs> well, that's the mark of a great horticulturist because uh, Lance Walheim, uh, one of our friends uh, who's been with, worked for Bayer for a number of years and written books on citrus and also wrote the book Roses for Dummies, <laughs> was the keynote speaker at the uh, National Rose Convention one year, and he spoke on uh, astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because his brother's an astronaut, Well, his right? brother is an astronaut, and they did take a rose up into space, and he brought that and showed that. But, you know, very little of the talk had to do with roses. <laughs> All right. Hey, we got to take an, uh, another quick break, but then when we get back, we'll continue talking with Melinda Myers. Yeah, those on Facebook Live, of course, uh, questions, comments for Melinda. Great opportunity. Uh, Biz Talk Radio, going to take a break, and uh, our fantastic supporters, sponsors of uh, this fine program, you'll be hearing that. And on Facebook Live, back even quicker, Melinda Myers, our guest today on Garden America. Stay with us. All righty, back on BizTalk Radio, Facebook Live. Those on BizTalk Radio, this is the final segment of our number one. And, of course, uh, you'll have news uh, and other things happening top of the hour. We are back at six minutes after. Facebook Live, though, we keep on rolling. Our guest today is, of course, a good friend of the show and you as well. Melinda Meyer has been talking about a lot of things in terms of uh, landscape architect and, and pre-planning and things like that, Tiger. Yeah, and we're chatting with Melinda about all the landscape design uh, questions you should ask, what things you need to consider, um, because there's there's so much out there right now. You know, there's websites like Shrub Hub and Yard Zen and, you know, other Shrub companies Hub. that are... Shrub you know, Hub, yeah, I like that, really. Yeah, and, and they're out there and they're advertising these opportunities to, you know, take a photo of your yard and they'll help you design it, um, which is great for people that, you know, need the help and need inspiration because not all of us are into plants or able to figure out what we would do with our space. Um, but you also want to make sure you know what questions to ask. And, you know, Melinda's bringing up a lot of good points about location, what you're going to do with it, be patient, um, kind of let it develop. Melinda, now you you also have some tips on your website, melindamyers.com, on garden and landscape design, on, you know, you know, different things that you need to consider. You know, you talk about prairie gardens, you talk about your you know, winter character trees and things like that. Um, when you are creating these kind of articles, when you're working with people on creating these articles, is it from the questions that you get asked at these you know, fairs and seminars that you go to and talk to people about? I'm sure they, you, they ask you questions. You're like, oh, that might be a great topic for a, a blog, right? Oh, exactly. And that's one of the reasons that I really like what I do. I always learn something I can pass along, but it also helps me stay connected. So I know what people are asking, just like you guys. You know, um, natives are huge right now for us and helping people realize how they can fit those into the whole scheme and the care and that just planting a native and walking a native plant and walking away isn't the solution that, you know, we have our soils aren't the same, our weather's not the same. And I'm not saying don't plant natives. There's wonderful native plants. But know whether it's a cultivated plant or a native plant, knowing what it needs and then the care required. Like you were talking about your hedge. Is this a plant, a perennial plant, that's going to eat the landscape, right, and take over? We want to avoid invasive plants that, you know, have escaped the garden and are invading our native planting space, our native areas like woodlands and wetlands and prairies. And so having a good idea of those plants. Mm. And then the other thing is when we buy our plants, and we we're talking instant results, and maybe it was watching too much TV this winter with <laughs> being kind of home, but I was so tired of seeing everything instant. Your house yeah. is redesigned in a weekend. Your landscape is done in a weekend. And, and then I think you know, when my stuff goes back into that newly designed house, it's going to look the same mess it was before. <laughs> you know, and if you don't plan your landscape for how you live, it's going to not give you the results. That design is going to fail. And so I think sometimes slower is better, and we talk to patients, and it's cheaper. You buy a small plant, 
it's not going to look the same as, you know, that big tree right. brought in, but you'll get to watch it grow. And I like to put in annuals and perennials that can easily be moved between my shrubs, even my perennials, to fill in those voids so I have color right away. But as those plants grow, I need fewer fillers, but I still have instant results. But with the long term in mind, I'm not going to have to divide those perennials. I'm not going to have to thin out the trees. I met a, a landscape, I heard a landscape architect speak one time, and he said, well, I recommend planting shrubs twice as close together as recommended, and then you go and thin out every other plant. <laughs> and I said, you don't know gardeners. We can hardly thin our beans. Yeah. We're not going to thin out a shrub we spent fifty, sixty, seventy dollars $70 on until right. it's too late, right? Then you're taking down the whole thing because they've shaded out each other, they've lost their form. And so sometimes you end up saving money not only on the initial investment but long term. And I think more importantly on time. Starting over ten years later, that's yeah. awful when you've invested time and energy and we're looking forward to that beautiful landscape. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because as you were speaking, um something came to mind. I was just at a commercial property a week ago and this was just brand new planted, and it had um, asparagus fern, um, my eye. My, is my eye the one that spreads like crazy, or your spring eye? Spring eye. Okay, so it was my eye, kind of the, with a foxtail or what? Are That's they a foxtail. The foxtail right? uh, asparagus right. fern. Melinda and, my eye is a great yeah, variety. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. It works well indoors in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, you know, so there was that, and then there was another fern, and they kind of you know, alternated them and they planted them close together because it's a commercial landscape and they wanted it done. Um, but I'm walking through the property. I'm like, yeah, like probably every other one of these plants in six months is going to have to go away because it's just too much. But what you brought up is a great option for that is plant them the way they were supposed to be planted and then fill in with a flowering perennial um, annual. But then when that annual perennial is done, now the plant behind it is the way it's supposed to be, and there is no thinning, and it's, and it's much better to plant a three ninety nine flower and let it <laughs> fail and go through its cycle than to plant a forty dollar plant and then have to pull it out later on. That's a great option. A lot of people need to know that because that is one thing that happens is people do plant their landscapes and then either it's not full enough or it's too full, you know, and they need to be ready to go with that as well, right, Melinda? You bet. We um, had at our, the energy park where I speak at our fair, we had to redo a garden. And, you know, we had to have it looking good for fair, and we had three months. And I so we put a lot of veggies and perennials and annuals, and nobody knew that those permanent plants, they were properly spaced. And it looked okay because we had enough color from other things for immediate results. And then, you know, what, seven years later, they're still in the same place. We did not have to remove them or brutally prune them to keep them in that space, which saved money and time and uh, just made it a lot easier in the long run. Yeah. All right. Hey, Melinda, we are going to have to take another break right now, but when we get back, we'll continue chatting with Melinda Myers. Um, and you have some events coming up that I want to talk about too as well. So um, we're going to take a break and get back with Melinda. Okay, yeah, that said, uh, wrapping things up with Melinda after the break. And those on BizTalk Radio, by the way, got news coming up top of the hour. So it is going to be uh, just a bit longer break for you. Facebook Live, we will regroup, come back with Melinda, a few more questions, more information, and then wrap things up as well. Still time, though, once we come back with Melinda, those on Facebook Live, if you have any questions or comments, post them right there on our Facebook page, and we'll do our best to answer those for you. Uh, that said, uh, happy weekend to you. Maybe you're listening to the show uh, a week after, like those on BizTalk Radio. Thank you for joining us. Maybe it's streaming or digital. Maybe it's a YouTube, Facebook Live. We appreciate all the ways that you can listen to us here on Garden America. Taking that break, back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. All righty, we continue to roll right along here. We say good afternoon to our friends on BizTalk Radio, six minutes after the hour. But here on Facebook Live, time does not matter. It's not even anywhere near six minutes after because we're on a different time zone here on Facebook Live. Because it is live, we've got Melinda Myers with us. Still time for a few questions or comments, Tiger, as we resume. 
Yeah, and Melinda, before the break, I'd mentioned you're you have a busy schedule the next few months. Is it just just overwhelming to get back into the whole mix of in person seminars and meetings, or is it a, a happy break from what you've been doing for the past year? You know, and uh, it, it it's a happy break. And what's nice is a lot of the things are outside. Many of them. Um, I have a green uh, Ebert's greenhouse village, which is a part. We're going to talk plants for creating fall beauty in your landscape. A sustainability fair, so I'll be indoors and out talking pollinator-friendly plants. As John mentioned, the Rose uh, Society, the American Rose Society meeting, and then I'm going to continue my webinars. Um, what was amazing to me is in the chat we have this community of gardeners, and it's allowed me to reach gardeners from many areas actually around the world, but also just to stay connected. And gardeners love to share, so even though it's not the same as in person, it was a nice connection we were all feel, feeling. And so I'm going to do some pruning tips, and hydrangeas are huge, so selection, planting, and care. So, yeah, on my website, melindamyers.com. And a thank you to Melorganite for sponsoring me to be on your radio show, but also for my appearance at the American Rose Society. So, Good partners, you know, it's a product that I know you guys use as well. Low nitrogen, slow release. You can use it on anything, and it'll keep that new landscape looking its best, too. So, Melinda, I uh, applied Melorganite uh, the past couple of days or so. Here in San Diego, of course, the month of August, it's very hot. But I assume I did nothing wrong by applying Melorganite in August here in Southern California. <laughs> you bet. And that's one of the nice things. It doesn't burn your lawn. It sits in the soil until the... the temperatures and the moisture are right for the plants to grow and for the microorganisms to break it down. So it's one of the best things to use in hot weather because it is goof proof and it won't burn your plants, which is really important for all of us dealing with heat, but especially you guys. Yeah, definitely is um, a safe fertilizer to use. Um, I think it was good that Melinda pointed out uh, that whatever Brian uses needs to be goof proof. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, there was no yeah. negative intention yeah. there, Brian. Yeah. Don't let him give you a hard time. We, but you bring up a good point in terms of it doesn't matter when you apply it, how you apply it, because for the most part, it's safe and, and it's got a built in protection for dummies. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, but those Not other, me, yes, other yeah, people. The other, the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, yeah, lots of lots of great stuff. Lots of great ways to connect with Melinda. MelindaMyers.com for more information. Um, you know, again, your whole webinar series that's excellent information for people. It's funny you mentioned the hydrangeas at the same. And I don't know. If, I don't know if you were on the program when I mentioned I went out and saw someone's roses and they were 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 not blooming and they were upset and but they were just not blooming at this time of year. Then he was also upset about his hydrangeas because they didn't look good. And the hydrangeas were perfectly fine. The flowers were just done, though. And I'm like, yeah, the, you just trim off the flowers, and then they get and new start, ones. And start over again. And, and, you know, but to him, the hydrangeas were, were dying. Like, they, there was something wrong with them. He felt they should have always had beautiful pink-blue flowers on them. And I'm like, no, they're just the flower is done. You just got to cut them off. So I think I will send your link to that uh yeah. that webinar for him because yeah they need some input on uh, picking out good hydrangeas so thank you very much for joining us this weekend melinda um you know take care good luck on all your events and uh, hopefully we'll get to see you in person soon i hope that that would be great i'd love it you guys take care thanks so much yeah Bye -bye. thank you melinda myers and again uh, even somebody posted what a great topic this is in terms of landscaping so on and so forth uh, I, you know what she was so right and, and john can attest to this you want to move in and start planning and, you know, doing the landscaping right away. And then you do that, and once you get settled, you realize, I don't spend as much time over here. Or the view is blocked. Uh, you should settle. And Because and, we're not patient. You know, we, we love to have things happen right now. Instant gratification is not always the key, as John always says. Well, you know, I was also thinking as she was talking about uh, the difference between planting annuals or perennials and trees. You know, if you think about it like decorating your house, if you put in a dining room table, it's going to be <laughs> there for a there. while, right? Yeah. It's going to stay there. But if you put in, put a little picture frame on a shelf, you, you know. Change that out. Change that out whenever you want. It. Like, look at the picture frame as a petunia. <laughs> but the table is a tree. Yeah. 
Yeah, not not so easy to move after the fact. Right. A uh, well, couple of questions. Um, I want to go back to. Well, you know, Lila was asking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about whether malorganite would be good for natives, and absolutely yeah. it would because one of the things, especially with California natives, uh, falls the best time for planting those. Right. Uh, if you're going to be putting in California natives, you don't want to encourage fast growth because uh, California natives are adapted to seasonal type growth. Yeah. And all malorganite is going to do is enrich the soil so they'll have better growing conditions. I think Lenore is concerned about her um, her tomatoes. Oh, they dead, they, dying leaves, whitish color, so on and so forth, so forth. And they're all in containers with fresh soil. Now, my tomatoes are doing fine. I've been yeah. watering a little more because of the heat. But you're really protected. So there you go, Lenar. Go visit Brian. Yeah. And he's got yeah. extras. But I, as Tiger says, I am protected. Yeah, and, you know, my tomatoes that are out exposed are also kind of doing a similar thing to Lenore's this time of year yeah. with the, with the, the summer and yeah. the weather. It's kind of, you know, that now. Well, she's I, in canyon country, Which is too, even Which is hot. hot. Even yeah. worse. And so what I found, and I do, and I don't know if it would work for Lenore, though, is trim them back, leave them. And then as it cools, sometimes they come back, you know, right. nicely yeah. as well during during the fall, and then they'll last all the way into the winter. You know, my experience is with my tomatoes, they're pretty tenacious. I, they're, they're like roses, mm -hmm. maybe not quite as, as aggressive. Well, they're not as thorny. And right. not as thorny, but right. I mean, I, yeah. when mine look a little peaked, I, I do cut them back, pull off all the dead leaves, and they seem to, to do just fine. That's an old person word. What's that? Peaked. Peaked. Did I say peaked? <laughs> yeah, did. you did. Did it? Yeah. I said peaked came out of my mouth? You're looking a little peaked Pe today. <laughs> yeah. Peaked. <laughs> so I remember my mother telling me that. <laughs> you look a little peaked today, John. Yeah. Man, you were only nine years old. Imagine <laughs> that. Nine year old peaked kid. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, you know, I don't know if she trims them back and. You know, and then just keeps. And then one of the biggest mistakes again people make during this time of year with that is they will fertilize and water them more, and sometimes they'll rot out the plant by watering it too much. And fertilizer, right. I don't think, is going to do too much in getting it to come back at this moment in time. No, and Melinda was talking about the plants not being able to take up water yeah. fast enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, those roots can only suck so quick. You know. I, I, yeah. for, I forgot the proper answer, <laughs> but anyway, it can only the way they can only take up water so so fast. Yeah, and um, and no amount of additional right, water gonna is going to help. You know, you brought up a great point about this person you visited about my plants are dying yeah. or they don't look good. Okay, a little advice when you buy, let's say, a hydrangea, read up on it. Mm. N know what to expect during a, this season, that season compare it to other plants that you've bought because it's not all going to be the same. And, and I think most people want to buy plants, plant them, and they're and supposed to look it. good all year. Yeah. All year long, they're supposed to bloom and look good. And that's not possible. It's so funny. Um, I was just talking to a friend last night, and she loves her cactus garden. She has a succulent garden, actually, not cactus. And she loves it. She takes care of it. She propagates from it. But she incorporated some blue fescue in the pathway up to her home in this area and you have to water the blue fescue more than the surrounding plants so she's very upset about that and she is like i'm i'm unhappy with the blue fescue i don't like to have to water it more i'm going to pull them out and she's going to put in these plastic or fake grass plants oh, there and i'm like i'm like that's ridiculous why don't you just plant more succulents you like succulents find one that will work for you and she wants that. grass there though but right? she wants a grass there and i'm like and then i know she has um rabbits so I say, I'm going to laugh at you the first time that the rabbits come over and eat down your fake grass. This is the way you talk because, to your customers. Yes. You're crazy. No, I'm going to laugh at you. Yes. I know. I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I do talk to the customers that we do. Sure, but, sure, of course. But yeah, but you know, it's funny. Like, you know, she wants something to be there all the time and then not to have to take care of them. I'm like, that's that's not plants. You you have to take care of, of them. Course. You have to encourage them. Of course. I mean, yeah. if it's worth having that particular grass right there, you, it seems to me you would do what it takes or, or else – there's lack of interest. You, yeah. you really don't want to have it there. Yeah. I don't know. Hey, we're going to take a break before John starts to talk because I hate to interrupt John every weekend. So when we come back after the break, and a short break on Facebook, by the way, we're going to kick things off with John because he has so much to say as we continue here on Garden America. Stay with us.
All righty, we roll along on this. Um, well, if you're live, it's a Saturday morning, maybe Saturday afternoon here on Garden America. Maybe you're listening to a previous show on our Facebook page. You can always go to our Facebook page and scroll down. All the shows from the beginning of mankind are there. In fact, it's the biggest no-brainer in the history of mankind, Tiger, <laughs> to watch our shows. Uh, YouTube is up and running. You don't have to watch us prior to the show. You hit it, boom, kicks right off. Lots of ways to listen. I would imagine in a week or so, another podcast is in the offing. Yeah, That's another it. newsletter with great information oh, next week. I, so sign up for our newsletter. John just basks in the element of his newsletter every week. I, I, I just we imagine, do. I just imagine John nowadays because he used to sit in an office at a at a at a grower commercial grower office. It was kind of like a one of those portable office buildings, typing away, creating a newsletter. But now but he's now, in his library. He, at well, home. he's got this oak book-filled library with natural light probably glistening through some kind of stainless glistening like light you know window you know that has colors and i can just see him in there with a smoking jacket and a pipe chipping away and he probably does it on a typewriter first and then has it transcribed to a computer is he he wearing a velvet robe (laughs) exactly (laughs) right john of course john uh no, <laughs> that's not right. With a with a rose in his lapel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Linda says that she has hydrangea blooms through fall. Yeah, I mean, you, if you but cut the they, old they, flowers, they, they turn colors. Y- yeah, you know, so they can and, be different colors on the yeah, same well, bush. Yeah, bush, no, no. and they'll they will stay. Like if you leave uh, uh, the old blooms on, they turn kind of greenish mm-hmm. for a long time. Can I give you a hy- quick hydrangea story? <laughs> About two months ago, three months ago, I'm, right. cleaning, I'm cleaning my fountain, and I'm using the Mr. Clean eraser in there after most of the water's out. Okay, well, that's bleach. We know that. So as I'm, you know, cleaning it, some of the water's splashing, and it splashed onto the area where the hydrangea was. So a day or so later, I look, and, oh, boy, these leaves aren't looking good. I must have got some bleach on there. Now what's going to happen? So I cut it back a little bit. Bingo. In a month, as green as can be. So... So you're saying to fertilize with bleach? I'm saying that if you get bleach on anything, <laughs> anyway, no hydrangea. Getting back to yeah, hydrangea, they're, they're, they they're bounce tough. back. They're very yeah. tough, and they did bounce back, and right. they look good. And I know hydrangeas is one of John's wife is favorite, uh, one of her favorite plants. Yeah, it is. And there's new hydrangeas now that bloom all summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the old hydrangeas had one bloom in the spring, and if you cut it off, that was it. And speaking of cutting back hydrangeas. Now would be the time if you need to control the height to cut them back because if you have the old hydrangeas, they bloom on your old wood. So if you cut them back in the spring, you're cutting off all the flowers. But if they're endless summer hydrangeas, they just keep blooming. Now, when you say new, somebody came up with somebody propagated these? They Yeah, I mean, the endless summer is what, maybe 10 years old? 10 years old. 10 years old. Yeah. That's, 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 that's really, that's new really in the new. gardening world. It is. It really is. I mean, new. Endless Summer is a great name, too. Yeah. That is a good name. For that, yeah. Especially when it turns to hydrangeas, because as John mentioned, before the Endless Summer, summer series came out, hydrangeas, hydrangeas were only known to bloom, you know, once a year, and then you cut them back, and then you had to wait. And like you, you know, John said, you had to know how to prune them back, mm-hmm. because then if you prune them back too hard in the winter time, they wouldn't bloom in the you know spring and summer when you wanted them to spring speaking of that you've seen the movie endless summer right and the second one and the second one so the first one not real professionally done just a bunch of guys with a camera 16 millimeter yeah but what a what a cult movie i saw that in the movie theater back when it came out yeah and it was big yeah the poster today you can still buy the poster was the sequel called endless fall (laughs) should have been endless summer too but yeah. Uh, yeah, Bruce Brown, I believe, yep. was the guy behind that. And his son helped with, too. What was his name? Yeah. Something, Dana Brown? I can't remember. Good. Anyway, in um, the summer, that's the topic, and that's the name of the uh, hydrangea. Yeah. My daughter sent me a picture <laughs> from... <laughs> that's so funny. ...from uh, Boise. Yeah. And it was a picture of a hydrangea in full bloom, and she goes, she goes, this hydrangea's in full sun. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like uh, 100 degrees up there, right? Yeah. But there are different types of hydrangeas. The the hydrangeas we grow in Southern California, which is what I think most people think of as hydrangeas, don't really do that well in cold temperatures like where Melinda lives. Mm-hmm. 
because as I was, of course, I guess the endless summer would do good there now. But the ones that would bloom on old wood, that wood would actually freeze during the winter and you would lose your buds. Right. Mm. So the one that uh, my daughter has up in Boise now is, uh, they're called PG hydrangeas, which is an abbreviation for paniculata grandiflora. Such an easy word to remember. Paniculata grandiflora. Right. Yeah. But they do they do well in full sun. And they have a little different shaped blooms, kind of conical. Yeah. Little smaller petals on the flower usually too. Um, it's interesting though because different regions, you know, when we were in England, I remember seeing rhododendrons and azaleas out in full sun, where that was not a normal right. plant for me to see in full now, sun. Now, is that because and it's cooler in, yeah, in England? It, they, and the sun's not as harsh. Well, like that's the thing is it's north. where we were, it was hot and it was sunny, right. but they don't have it like we have it. Right, meaning right. their sun and their heat is for a very short period of time, yeah. so it's okay. Where we have eight months of sun and heat. And they couldn't tolerate that here. So it's, you know, and then in Boise, as you mentioned, you know, they have a winter. So it's those those hydrangeas can winter there where they don't winter here real well because we don't get cold enough. Right. So, yeah, it's it's neat being able to grow plants. I, I remember seeing a Japanese maple in full sun up in Sacramento years, years and years ago. And I was blown away because I never thought Japanese maples could grow in full sun, especially in Sacramento. But then they get the winter, and it grows better there. So, yeah. It's just amazing. I'm just uh, taken aback every week by the information that spews forth. <laughs> <laughs> just what comes out of our mouths and our heads. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, when is it time yeah. to put in your fall garden, vegetable garden? For uh, us in Southern California? Yeah, maybe I would think September? coming up pretty soon, right? Yeah. Next month? Yeah. You want it to because you want it to be established by the time falls here. Yeah, you definitely seeds September, and you know plants September, depending on you know which ones. But sometimes you got to protect them too because then you get those Santa Ana winds right, in October. That's what I was thinking, yeah. and it's tough. Yeah. So you you got to be careful with it in the fall because of it, it's almost like in the Midwest where they have to may, wait till um, Mother's Day to plant their uh, spring garden oh, right. it's like we have to wait till after our last santa Ana win to plant our fall garden <laughs> that's another thing in october it could, it could just come along and then just wipe everything, wipe everything out, out and be dry everything's dried out yeah yeah and the the cabbage moths are still active right <laughs> so you, those beautiful white fluttering yeah cabbage moths. butterflies we're going to take a break and come back uh looking at the old facebook page uh a few comments here and there, so plenty of time. Whatever's on your mind, we'll do our best to address that uh, gardening question. On your uh, weekend, it is Garden America. John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox, Brian Maine. We're going to take a quick break. Biz Talk Radio, Facebook Live. If you're on Biz Talk Radio, as we say, back after these messages. All righty, yes. It is such a good time to be here in the studio. Great discussions. We're going to package up our uh, between-segment discussions and uh, sell those on the Internet, Tiger. <laughs> yeah, right. But we are back talking in gardening and horticulture, of course, landscaping today with Melinda Myers. And, uh, of course, John has a lot to say. Hey, did you look at the um, uh, the pictures, you know, 
on our newsletter, on our newsletter. every week. Yeah. We encourage our listeners to send in pictures you of what's get, growing in their garden. Is there no problem you getting pictures all the time? Is that a steady stream of pictures? Uh, it's Yes, it's a Good. S- steady stream. And if you want to send your pictures and appear in the newsletter, john at gardenamerica.com. You but, can be a published photographer. Yeah, but the reason I bring it up is that Di- uh, Diane in Santa Maria sent in pictures of her pixie grapes, and she had a, a really good harvest. Because, you it, know, pixie grapes looks are like, little. looks like real grapes. Yeah, and they're small plants, yeah. right? Yeah. So the best, the best uh, was it? John from John and Bob's, who planted oh, a, yeah. a, a, vineyard. A, a vineyard of pixie grapes in in, in his easement. Right. I've never seen that. That was so funny. So, yeah, uh, pictures to John at GardenAmerica.com. Hey, the newsletter, uh, go to our, our brand new, new and improved website, GardenAmerica.com, and you can sign up for the newsletter. I'm excited to hear that Melinda's attending and, and going out to state fairs and but that's those rolling expos out again. again because – you know, what a great opportunity for people to get out and look at the gardens. I mean, I know at a lot of them they'll do little vignettes. Different groups will do vignette gardens mm-hmm. with themes and ideas for people to get inspiration to plant in their own garden. Um, and, I mean, it's one of those things that you didn't miss until it was gone. Right, and, exactly. And, and yeah, I yeah. I did those for years. For years, our nursery would put one together. It was always a lot of hard work, and you got to take care of it. And I haven't wanted to attend one of those for a while. You burned out. I I was. But now that they've been taken away, I'm looking forward. Because they're not back yet here in San Diego. But they, um, I'm sure they will be back. And I look forward to when they come back. There was a line in a song, right? You don't know what you got till it's gone. That was uh, 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 put up a parking lot. That was Judy Judy Collin? No. No. um, um, the other one. The other one, yeah. The other Judy? Oh, my gosh. No, it's Come not on. Judy. Come on, John. Oh, my mind just went blank. I know who it is. Bill Collins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, female singer from the 70s. Uh, not Judy Collins. Uh, she was during Joan Baez's time. Yeah, and she's good friends with the Crosby, Stills, Nash, and all those. That whole Laurel Canyon. <laughs> yeah, that whole Laurel so Canyon, L.A. thing in the 70s. Uh, yeah. Somebody will probably post it on Facebook will, who yeah. that was. That's terrible. I can't remember something. It's my industry. I should know this. Really? You you have a great memory of bands and songs. I would I have no clue. Just, I can't I cannot sing a song from start to finish. I have I don't know. You any know it's song. interesting because when you grow up in it all the time and that's part of what you do. It's like TV theme songs. Who doesn't know Gilligan's Island from start to finish? I you I don't. don't. Well, no. that was before your time. But even then, if there was one. Friends, right. I don't know their song. Okay, here's one I bet you know from Johnny Mitchell. To Joni Mitchell. Yeah. Thank you, John. Big yellow taxi. The internet's great. <laughs> I bet you know this song from beginning to end. The Star Spangled Banner. I, Come on. I, not, not definitely if you put me on the spot. No. Well, maybe not in front of a stadium. No. How does it start? We'll say, can you see? <laughs> oh, yeah. <All> right. <laughs> well, let's say, can you... I bet your kids know songs from oh, the Oh, my kids to the know end. songs. They, they know songs a lot. Diane put yeah Facebook Joni Mitchell, thank you Diane. Gosh <laughs> Almighty, I uh, remember that Joni Mitchell did not while she was very popular as a folk singer. She didn't have a lot of hit songs. She had about three or four. Yeah, she did. Really? Yeah, she did. Yeah. So we're inviting our Facebook know. viewers I think right the now. The same to thing post. about Joan Baez. She didn't really have a lot. No, of, she sang everybody else's yeah. songs. She did have. Um, the night they drove old Dixie down, right? Right. right. That but, was probably her best. You know, but that was that, her, her her rendition. That reminds me that there's a rose I'm trying to find that was named after Joan Baez's sister. Really? Yeah. That's got to be a rare Why? rose. Why you trying to find yeah. this rose? Just because it's because rare? It's yeah, extremely rare. I think it might. I mean, about. it's close to extinction. I did find someone in Texas. Who has one? And I'm going to have to, now that you remind me, so see if I can get a in this, cutting. In this situation, I'm assuming that like you have this rose in mind, and you go to, um, is it the Help Me Find yeah, Roses? Uh, right. And if anybody has it, and then you're like, oh, they have it. I think I might want it. Do you just drop them an email, <laughs> show up on their doorstep, and say, hey, 
I'd like to have one of your roses. Help Me Find does have a uh, way that you can email other members. Like message them. Right. Some some don't accept private messages and others do. Uh-huh. But the ones that do, sometimes you can you can uh, send them a and note then, and, and then get a somebody, response. And then you send in and say, hey, I'd love to have some um, I'd like bud, a wood, cutting, yeah. bud wood from your rose. And do they say, get out of here, you weirdo? Or... <laughs> What are you? What are you stalking? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming. I'm, a, I'm assuming if they're on the Help Me Find Roses, they kind of know already to expect that kind of question. Depends who you're asking. If you went up to a person on the street and said, Give me some "Hey, bud I'd like some roses. budwood from your rose," <laughs> they'd probably punch you out. Yeah. But yeah. if you're on Help Me Find, I there I usually find people are really happy to do, comply. Do I, you help with people? Do you? Yes, yeah, a matter of fact, I got an email from someone at the Utah Rose Society mm -hmm. just this week uh asking about a particular rose. Yeah. And, and it was one you had still? I did. And I sent budwood I sent a plant last week to someone in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, who was looking for a particular rose, Did and you? I happened to have one, and I sent it out. So. Repopulating one rose yeah. at a time. Yeah, you know, John. Yeah. See, not I just a collector. I don't also. care what they say about you. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know all those people that Mimi Farina is Joan Baez's sister, and that's the name of the rose. It sounds more like a name of a rose than it does a person. Mimi Farina, <laughs> doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, that is a good rose name. That's what probably yeah, the it's, person who created the rose heard it and was like, "That's a good rose." That's a, name. Not not a good human name, but a good <laughs> rose name and excellent name. No, just uh, kidding. If, if you're listening or watching, yeah, sorry, Mimi. <laughs> yeah, if you go to YouTube, you can see a 1973 video of Joan Baez and her sister singing. Oh, look at. Our crack research department, <laughs> which is comprised of John Bagnasco. But now I have to uh, find out and help me find roses if anybody has that particular rose and see if I can get it. I, well, now that we're talking about getting roses, today or this week someone contacted me and said, I have cuttings of Reba McIntyre. Oh. And I'll be happy to send, send in cuttings to... Uh, Wisconsin roses, if anybody wants one. And Reba McIntyre's not that rare a rose, but no one in the United States propagates it anymore. Oh, so it's one of those ones that's going to become rare as time goes on because it could. of the lack of propagation. It could. Sometimes roses in other countries, uh, you know, there's there's plenty of them, so you never have to worry about it. Yeah. Like, um, it's hard to believe, but iceberg is not as popular in Europe as it is here. <laughs> or in other parts of the country. For some reason, California is the iceberg capital of the world. Probably because it was it was a Weeks rose, right? Wasn't that one of the first people to really produce it, Weeks? No. No? Oh. No. <laughs> oh, I just figured they were here in California, and I thought it was one of their roses. So. No, I think it started up in uh, Newport Beach. Everybody started planting it because it's a rose that blooms all the time yeah, and uh, does good in coastal conditions. And then it just kind of spread from there. Yeah, like a disease. <laughs> <laughs> so besides your roses, what else keeps you busy in the garden, <laughs> garden-related? Because I know that takes up 90% of your time. That's pretty much That's it. That, you, but you have other stuff planted. Trees. I mean, you have other, don't you? Orchid? Do you have any orchids? No. See, well, actually, I do. Now that I think of it, I've got somebody gave me some uh, epidendrons, Ooh. and oh, they're yeah. just cuttings, which I stuck in a pot last year, and now they're getting ready to bloom. They have bloom spikes on them. And I do have some bidiums, but they won't bloom until winter. See, I think if I started orchids, I couldn't stop. One of those. You would things. have to make room in your patio because, yeah. But the problem, you Who know. Who was it that told me they were reading The Orchid I Thief? Am. Was that you? Yeah. yeah, yeah like, do you like it? it? It's it's interesting. It's yeah, neat. it's interesting. It's, it's interesting. It's well, not a page. Game, it's not a page turner. No, it's not a page turner by any means. But it is interesting. We've got to, to take kind a break. Learn, and we're going to talk about this fantastic book that Tiger is engrossed in. <laughs> He's loving it. It's about orchids. We're going to take a break here on Garden America. Stay with us. One more segment, by the way.
Okay, uh, just like that, we are back on BizTalk Radio and uh, Facebook Live just before the break. We were talking about orchids and a book that Tiger is reading that is just okay. The name of the book again? The Orchid Thief. And yeah, and it's, it's a story. not grabbing you, but it's okay. Well, it's an interesting story about... It's um, a true story. It's a true story right. uh, about a gentleman who kind of you know, was a, a black market orchid person and, you know, stealing orchids out of a Floridian forest. And, you the know, Everglades, just, right? It was the ghost orchid. That yeah, the was, ghost orchid. And in, I'm trying to think of the, 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 the reservation. I'm trying to think of... It has an interesting name. But um, it's... it's n- The way they describe orchid collectors, I think, is a good portrayal because definitely, and John's mentioned this before, the reason why he's never gotten into orchids is because it's addicting and it's truly a cult thing. Right. And Uh unlike a rose where you can create a new rose in one year, orchids take seven or more years to get it to flower again and all of that. And and what's the advice when people buy an orchid? And it dies, and they're waiting for the next year. Yeah. Just buy another just buy, one. <laughs> exactly. <Right? laughs> and so, um, you know, when it comes to plant collecting, I think definitely orchids is def- at the top of the food chain in the sense of you get into it, you start collecting, and then your collection, you just start going down a rabbit hole and trying to find something more rare And then you discover just how unique. many there are. It, and then where I think it's the growing, largest plant family in the world, right? It is. It yeah. is the largest plant family. Because there's things associated with orchids that you would never even think of. Well, I mean, to go to the extremes, you've got orchids in the warmest deeps of the jungles that survive with, you know, inches and inches and inches of rainfall. And they're usually in the trees, right? Yeah. And then you have orchids on the alpine, you know, slopes yeah. in different yeah. areas that, you know, are freezing cold. And and so they, they say that the orchid is probably the most evolved plant because it requires no soil. You know, in the exactly. sense of they yeah. so so they feel orchids are the plant that mutated and evolved quicker than any other species based on survival. Yes. So so they don't need soil. So let's say that that was an epiphyte in a tree. Is yeah. That, is okay. So oh, wait a second. Epiphytic orchids yeah. don't need soil. That's what right. I'm talking about. Terrestrial orchids do. But I'm saying. But I'm saying. Yes, I'm saying. So an epiphyte orchestra uh, orchestra um, orchid. Well, let's say that it's in a tree, okay? Mm-hmm. Right. So it's getting its nutrients from that tree? No, no. No, they're not parasitic at all. And that's why they say there's even more so evolved is because they don't even require the tree to provide it anything. They just they just get it from the air and the moisture around They just it. need a pad to hang out. Yes. <laughs> I just need to Well, hang yeah, out. a pot for an epiphytic orchid is just a reference point. Right, right. Yeah. You see how those air roots come out of the pots? Yeah, yeah, sure. They never need to be covered. Well, you know, that's interesting that, that you talk about how highly developed they are. Just give me a place to crash. Uh, yeah. I, just, and, I just need right. a host. Now, that, now within the 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 tree limbs, uh, the, the crotches of the limbs, where they nestle and they grow, there'll be decaying leaves yeah. and, and things in there, and they do get nutrients from that. Right. Yeah. But then even their reproduction is also a whole nother thing on – you know, their stamen, their pistil, like, and how each one is pollinated differently by a specific creature that's in that forest as well. You know, in the book, they talk about this one that had this really long, I think it was stamen, and how it required a moth or something to have that tongue to be able to pollinate it. And, you know, you would never find this moth anywhere else in the world. So this can only Well, not only that, that particular orchid... Uh, which had a long tube with the reproductive parts at the end of the tube, right? Yeah. They, they, this moth had never been seen. Yeah. So they theorized that an, uh, a pollinator, probably a moth, must exist. To, to actually pollinate this plant. Right. And then they later on discovered that particular moth and found out that it had like the longest tongue in the world <laughs> or something yeah. in order to get down there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, they're just highly evolved. And so when you kind of start going down this rabbit hole on orchid collecting, and it's not even so much that the orchid is pretty, but there's just something about it that is oh, so I think interesting. They, I, think they, I think they are. They are. No, they are pretty, but... Well, there's you know, orchids that that actually look like insects oh, mm-hmm. yeah, we've to had, attract the other insect. Right. And we've to, had pictures that we right. posted 
Yeah. Along. So what you're saying is if we're not careful, orchids could take over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They they probably are the foundation of that little hobby shore. Hort, little shop of some, right. a movie attack of the killer <laughs> so, orchids. So the three things to, to be concerned with orchids, right? <laughs> yes. As far as taking over, we don't have, don't have to worry about dolphins. They don't have thumbs. <laughs> the other would be cockroaches, and then Keith Richards. <laughs> I think I think those three those are, are going to be the last three they're, things. They're just always going to be here. <laughs> Keith Richard and cockroaches, <laughs> same thing. What's the difference, right? <laughs> uh. Okay. Unbelievable. Okay, guys, a couple of minutes to go here. Yeah. As we kind of covered everything. The, the world of orchids here. Well, yeah. Tiger talking about the orchid thief. I don't know if he has had enough of orchids, but I thought a much better book than The Orchid Thief was Orchid Fever. Uh huh. And uh, it gives the history of the CITES Treaty, the uh, Endangered Species Treaty worldwide, and explains how. Uh, plants were just added like the last week. Yeah. And, you know, because it was to protect endangered animals. Mm -hmm. And we had this worldwide treaty. And actually, it ended up being a detriment to preservation of plants because there was really no thought that went into it. Oh. And so if you're in a rainforest and you have rare plants and you're putting in a road, you can bulldoze those plants and kill them, but you can't go in and save them. Yeah. And that's how we're going to end the show. Makes no Nicely sense. Nicely done, John. <laughs> <laughs> but but to leave on it, too, succulents are in the news right now because a lot of people are trying to get endangered rare succulents because of social media, and people see them, and then they go to forests and take out succulents. It's the new orchid. Really? Yeah. I know it was a problem in California with Dudleyus for yep. a while. Yeah, yeah, and it's expanding. All right. Well, thank you. You watching us on Facebook Live, those listening on BizTalk Radio, we appreciate your support. Don't forget to go to our YouTube page, which is uh, Garden America Radio. All the shows are posted there. Uh, you can scroll up and down on our Facebook page. Podcast coming up in a couple of weeks. So much going on. How do we do it? Volume. <laughs> so until next time, which will be next Saturday, have a safe week. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll do it again here on Garden America. Brian Maine, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. Adios.